Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm the Arts Development Manager at Accessible Arts. For those of you who don't know us, Accessible Arts is the peak disability organisation in New South Wales. We advance the rights and opportunities for people with disability or who are deaf and to develop and sustain professional careers in the arts and have equitable access to the arts and culture. Before we, begi we begin, I would like to warmly welcome Daniel McDonald to commence our event with a welcome to country. Good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel McDonald. I'm a proud Aboriginal deaf man and my mob are from the Wanarua land on the Hunter Valley region. I'm a member of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and I'm involved in the First People's Disability Network and also I'm on the advisory panel of the City of City, Sydney of City Council. And I'm here to give you a warm welcome to Gadigal land. I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters here today. It doesn't matter if you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, we are all brothers and sisters. As we joyfully meet here on Gadigal land, it is only right that we honour and pay our respect to the, to the traditional custodians of these lands and waters. Today is the 19th of September 2023 and we are here at Accessible Arts to build your future, to build your audience here at the Bell Shakespeare. And I want to welcome the panel today and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm looking forward to it. I think you're all nervous. You'll be fine. <laughs> and my art story is here. It is called Inclusion. The dreams and hopes of many people. The hopes and dreams of many people, but we still have a long way to go and we can never let the spirit fade away. We have hope. The history is a true story of true leadership and hope. We need to have hope and for it to change for the better. Hope is never too soon and hope is never too late. On Gadigal land here today stands another us. We are a confident, proud, all-inclusive community. I would like to, I'd like to acknowledge the people before us who have struggled and forged the way so we can enjoy the freedoms we have today. We need to remember the past, respect, acknowledge and love in the present. We need to have inclusion and understanding and hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Daniel, for opening our event. I would like to thank Bell Shakespeare for hosting this event and delivered by Accessible Arts with the support of Create New South Wales and the City of Sydney. Today, we are joined by an expert panel, Olivia Ansell, Festival Director at Sydney Festival, <laughs> Janelle Ryan, Accessibility Operations Manager at Sydney Opera House, and James Winter, Co-Founder and Director of Brand X. The theme of the panel is Build Your Audience, and we will hear from these leading Sydney venues and organisations as they explore ways to better connect and engage with the 18% of Australians living with disability through prioritising access and accelerating representation. At the end of this panel, we will have some time for audience questions. 
Um, for our online audience, so this is a hybrid event today, uh, these questions can be submitted via Slido, which is embedded to the right-hand side of your screen. And for those using keyboard navigation, you will need to tab past the video controls to access this. Alternatively, you may submit a spoken question um, with a microphone if you're in audience, or you can um, use the Slido QR code up on the screen now. Um, if you are an Auslan user, you can message Accessible Arts through our Facebook page and submit a question that way. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> um, please know that we have a wonderful full audience today, so um, it's possible we might not get to all the questions um, that may come up during the panel. Um, and lastly, I'd like to introduce our MC, James N. Evans, Associate Director of Bell Shakespeare. James is an actor and director and was last seen in Romeo and Juliet at The Nutshell, which is next door. Um, welcome, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for that introduction. And, uh, and can I say thank you, Daniel, for that absolutely beautiful, moving, inclusive and uniting welcome to country. Thank you so much. That was um, a wonderful way to start our morning. Welcome to all of you joining us online as well for this stimulating and exciting panel discussion event on building our audience, the 18% reaching that 18% of the Australian population who identify as having a disability. How, what are we doing? What can we do better? Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about with our panelists today who are, now, th this is, the, this, this part of the discussion is always the most awkward where you sit with gritted teeth as I uh, talk through every single production that you've ever been involved in. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to keep it brief, keep the intro brief if you don't mind. Olivia Ansel, friends, uh, as you know, is a leading curator, uh, producer, director and performing artist, choreographer, currently the director of the Sydney Festival and was previously head of contemporary arts, uh, contemporary performance at the Sydney Opera House, among other roles. Janelle Ryan has worked in the arts industry for over 23 years, now head of accessibility ops at the Sydney Opera House, uh, where she's responsible for all of the Sydney Opera House's extensive uh, access action plans. And James Winter here is a, a theatre director who's worked at State uh, Opera Company of South Australia, um, at State Theatre Company of South Australia, among others. Co-founder of Brand X, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, and, uh, and the amazing work that they do repurposing uh, properties for creative projects. Also a member of the Sydney, of City of Sydney's Cultural and Creative Sector Advisory Panel. So welcome, all three of you, uh, to this panel. Now, of course, if you want to build an audience, uh, you know, it's not just about spending more money on marketing or, or promotions and so on. These days, it's becoming increasingly important for organizations to explore lots of different avenues for engaging with their current audience and, of course, drawing in new audiences. Now, the esteemed panelists we have with us today represent arts organizations that are at the forefront of this exploration, focusing on building connections, on fostering representation and nurturing creativity. And uh, in our discussion today, uh, we're going to be talking about engaging audiences, um, um, audience members with disabilities. But if representation matters, which we all agree it does, we can't talk about engaging audiences without also talking about engaging and employing artists uh, with a disability. So we're going to start there. Uh, Olivia, um, the Sydney Festival obviously has a great history of programming works by and with artists with a disability. What have been a couple of notable highlights for the festival? How, how have you connected uh, with audiences mm. with those projects? Thanks, James. Before we begin, I to acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, in terms of Sydney Festival, I think one of the um, major highlights for the festival in years gone by uh, was back in 2009 when Fergus Linehan curated Small Metal Objects by Back to Back Theatre yep. Company. And I think that was at a, an interesting time where maybe we weren't seeing um, as much work uh, presented by artists with a disability than we would now. Mm. Um, and I think that that was such an extraordinary moment of theatre in Australia. And if you look at the sort of the pathway that Back to Back have had since then, we, um, the, the popularity of that work and what that work did 
um, in terms of visibility yep. and attracting a whole new realm of audiences and awareness. Uh, we actually tried to present that work in 2022 um, as part of a retrospective. We wanted to bring it back because we felt like it was absolutely time that audiences could experience that piece again. Very sadly, it got Omicron <laughs> COVID cancelled. But um, look, uh, for, for me too, because, you know, sort of back then, I was an artist in Sydney and, and it changed my life seeing that work and made me think differently. And I'd like to think that it was that impact years later as a producer and a curator that um, sort of shapes how, how we roll and what, what we sort of choose to engage with. Mm. Mm. And how does it impact audiences when they see, when they see the work? Obviously, you're, you're bringing mm. in artists with a disability, but you're, you're working with a, a very broad, mm. wide, general audience. How does it impact them seeing mm. these works put up on Oh, stage? I think it's representation. You know, um, I sat on a panel last week um, for the Australian Performing Arts Forum, and uh, they commented that there was four female artistic directors sitting up there on the panel, because at the moment with the major festivals, we, we have women. And I said, you know, women for many years, it was just, you never saw a female artistic director. And yeah. so women know what it feels like to be left out. Similarly, um, we also know what it feels like for artists, um, diverse artists, uh, artists with a disability, not to be included. To, so to suddenly have a program, for example, last year, Sydney Festival 2023, we had 11 artists living with a disability represented in our program and 59 accessible performances for audiences and artists to see that visibility, to see that representation. It then, um, it fosters that growth and that trust in us as a festival that we'll continue to do that. And it builds audiences yeah. through that way. Um, you know, like I think in the past people couldn't see what they couldn't see. And now what we're seeing is um, a lot more inclusivity into how festivals are programming, but we can always do better as well. Like this is um, an, an ongoing sort of, um, growth position mm. of the festival. No doubt, no doubt. Now, uh, Janelle um, from the Sydney Opera House, let me ask you, um, you've been doing some work with the Accessible Arts team and uh, last uh, earlier this year, I think it was, you you organised um, for the entire programming and production team to undertake extensive training with Accessible Arts focused on working with artists with a disability. What was the content of that training and, and what did you guys learn from that? Well, I think it's really interesting that when I see organisations offering disability awareness training, they often focus it on the front of house or the front line teams, which is absolutely justified. Like inclusive customer service practice is, is fantastic and that's yeah. what we need. But we really wanted to offer that knowledge to our programming and production teams. We wanted to deepen our engagement with artists with disability. We wanted to work with companies that were disability led. Um, and we also wanted to ensure that our back of house practices were safe and inclusive. Mm. So we had a great turnout. We had 35 staff. We did two half day sessions yeah. and it was, they came so engaged. They came with scenarios. They came with lots of really meaningful questions. Mm. And we really ended up having a, a robust discussion about what do we do now and mm. what can we do better? Yeah. So I think it was just a real reminder that every single team in your organization can get something out of and, and really be productive with disability awareness. And it, it can do a lot to you know, change culture as well. Yeah, culture absolutely is crucial. And that's a long-term yeah. goal that we all aspire to. Have you noticed any differences kind of in day-to-day -day ops um, at the Sydney Opera House as a result of this training? Yeah, we recently had a season from Restless Dance Theatre. They did Exposed at the Sydney Opera House. For those who saw it, it was fantastic. And we made the entire season relaxed. Mm. Um, and it was just the little things, like when we were setting up the after party for opening night, yep. we had a ramp to the stage. Yeah. I know that sounds small, but it didn't have to be asked for. It didn't have to be kind of the artist didn't have to say, well, I need this, this and this. The, the teams discussed it and asked them because they knew that would be required. Mm. And it's just those little bits and pieces of making inclusive practice just part of every day. Right. Yeah. So I think it's incredibly valuable. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. Uh, James Winter, you are the founder of Brand X. Can you just tell us a little bit about who Brand X is and what, and what they do? Yeah, sure. Uh, we're a service organisation, so we partner with the private and property sectors and transform unused or underutilised buildings into workspace for artists. So, mm. in some in in some extent, we don't actually do anything with audiences, but we do host on behalf of the artists, yeah. their audiences in, in our venues. But 
our main goal is very much about uh, uh, participation and productivity. Uh -huh. and the really exciting thing about this extremely new journey of Brand X with accessibility is the fact that we get to witness new stories yeah. and new voices. Mm. And it's almost like it's a no-brainer because the stories that we currently have in mainstream are kind of coming to the end of their life, their shelf life to some degree. And yet on our doorstep are these communities that are so hungry to be productive that it's a no-brainer to open the doors to it. Um, Daniel, you are correct. We are nervous. We are nervous and that makes inertia. And I can tell you that we have um, not transformed our organization in the past because we didn't want to get it wrong, Daniel. Um, but the interesting thing, this is a story of a relationship. Mm. And that relationship for us starts with one person, Dan Graham, who might be watching. Um, <laughs> and it was through uh, an engagement with a professional artist that it all kind of just, the difficulty of it just melted away mm. and the opportunity revealed itself. And it's almost like secretly, don't tell anyone, I think we win more and I look forward to it so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan Graham getting the first of perhaps many shout outs today. Um, <laughs> uh, James, um, the, uh, uh, there's, there's a residency at the moment at Brand X, the Flying Nun Performing Arts Residency, which is really opening up the doors for contemporary and experimental um, arts practice. And you've actually embedded access into the program. How has that expanded the reach of artists supplying for this? Yeah, residency? fine. So this has all been through consultation. Number one, big, huge thing, always ask. <laughs> and ask the yeah. exper experts in the room. And those experts are artists, professional artists with lived experience of disability. So that through their generosity, but also us doing homework first. Um, they just provided us with such simple tools. Oh my goodness. You know, just even the way in which you communicate an opportunity in a couple of different formats. It's quite easy. Also offering like kind of soft deadlines as well. Um, mm. Also making sure that we're able to receive applications uh, in different form and formats as well. But then also providing time and people and dedicated people and a budget um, so that then that person, that artist can approach us in the shape and form that they need to be able to communicate. Mm. And in actual fact, that probably is a lot more better than the archaic systems that we think about when we're applying for arts funding or opportunities and stuff like that, because that's where the richness is, right? Is the relationship that you have with the presenting artist and yeah. that kind of stuff. So simple things that happen so that we can uh, do what we say on the tin. Um, and then that kind of then moves into the, the audiences that we host on behalf of the artists. And what we've learned is that it's actually relatively simple. We don't own any of our buildings, so we can't transform infrastructure. But what we can do is explain the hell out of it from journey to seat to you know, back home and that kind of stuff. So a person has agency to go, ah, I can do that or I, mm, I can't do that. Mm, mm. So it just gives people the opportunity to not have any surprises. Mm. <laughs> and we abled people demand that as well. So the freaky thing is it's all about justice, right? So we are probably more likely to be able to transform a lot more. And that is just simply um, looking at the detail and consulting with lived experience and then applying that as soon as possible. Mm. Thank you, James. That's great. Now, um, Olivia, let me ask you, we, we talked a little bit about um, the work that the festival has done in the past with artists with disability. Uh, your role obviously is the chief curator. You've got to put this festival together each year. How do you go about seeking out new opportunities to, to support and develop work by artists with, with uh, a, a disability? Yep. And um, it, it really is a team effort. Mm -hmm. So um, the entire programming team build deep relationships, myself as well, with um, the local interstate um, um, and international, international art sector. Yep. It really comes to, I mean, you know, there's this sort of like uh, sort of 
a bit of a fallacy that you kind of walk around with a checkbook just booking what show you like or, you know, it's so far from that. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, because people used to say that to me decades ago and I thought, gosh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, I just imagine like Leo Schofield flying around on a plane with a yeah. checkbook, you know, it, was, it definitely isn't like that. It's deep, deep conversation and collaboration yeah. and it's people like James will be having a conversation. I mean, a lot of the amazing new work that comes through Brand X um, comes to the festival after it's done like a small season and then an artist might write another funding application and, and develop that further and then it ends up in the program like it's this ecology that mm. that happens mm. and um there are these chance opportunities where you have a conversation with somebody and you learn something that another stakeholder is doing they tell you about an artist like last year um we presented a one woman theater play by an artist with lived experience with dwarfism and the only way i would know about that work is keeping close to um to Craig Donarski at Kashula Powerhouse. And so it's conversations yeah. and conversations, you know, it's um, meeting with peers internationally. What have you seen? Um, what are you yeah. working on? What, uh, keeping close with accessible arts. Yeah. And um, yeah. as a Rebecca Spicer, our associate producer is going up to the Undercover Festival this week in yeah. Brisbane. Yeah. Um, lots of relationship building and conversations. And, um, you know, I was actually thinking though, just before this panel started, um, a lot of artists are represented by agents, particularly, you've, I think, in Australia, we sort of know our local um, sort of artist ecology, so we have direct dialogue, but with international artists, sometimes it's a direct dialogue and sometimes it comes through a third party. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about the export of artists with a disability to festivals internationally and thinking, I think that's there's a space there, like for an agency to represent these incredible yeah. artists, these yeah. you know, contemporary stories, like how, how is that reciprocity? Is that happening? Is that a thing? Can we make it a thing? Yeah, um, yeah like I, I'm not, I, I should talk to back to back further about that. I know they have um, that type of representation internationally, but- um, Has government been involved? DFAT been involved in uh, uh, with Certainly that? in funding some of these projects yeah. to get overseas. I think Restless Dance Company and back to back are great examples. But mm. um, I think that, you know, raising awareness of the incredible work happening here in this country and how we can share that work with the world. I'd be curious to sort of know uh, what we can do further to okay. support that. Yeah, mm. fantastic. Uh, now, Janelle, um, this is really interesting because you have currently started exploring accessible technology initiatives, new tech, like haptic vests, yes. which, which help people to feel what music feels like if they can't hear it. So, so how, <laughs> what impact has that had on your audience? How do, what have you learned about this technology and, and, and what's going to happen in the future with this stuff? Well, in November 2022, we trialled some haptic vibrational vests on the forecourt of the Sydney Opera House. It was for Fat Freddy's Drop. Um, and we had some adults from Deaf Australia come down and try those out. And that was thanks to Paul Nanaria. Paul Nanari from Department of uh, Regional New South Wales and Government. He loaned us those vests. So essentially what happens is that the deep bass frequencies are transferred via audio connection into physical sensations on a wearable outfit. Essentially that's it. Um, it was a really interesting trial. It wasn't entirely successful, I would say, because it only transferred the deep bass frequency. So you only really got an overwhelming kind of um, thump, thump, thump of the experience. So I've done deep diving, come across super interesting people in this space. The people that are working on this emerging technology from all over the world. Um, and the vests I'm most interested in are actually ones that um, they have technology so that you can have a haptic mix. So you can take the audio input and it can be transferred to different parts of the vest. So you could have vocals here. If you wanted, you could have deep bass here, or maybe you have a wrist that has, you know, violins on the wrist vibrating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really interesting space to be looking at. Um, we're look, interested in having it at the Sydney Opera House. Um, it is emerging, mm. so it is a bit of a looking at what's actually ready to be used yeah. in theatres and spaces. I'm probably more interested in seeing how it can change the art form because I'm, I don't just want to say, hey, here's a show, take the best, how does that feel for yeah. you? I'm more interested in what can it do for, say, maybe deaf artists on the stage. Mm -hmm. I know that Newmarket Collective in Victoria recently did a show called Across Silence, 
and they used VESS on stage with artists and in the audience. Yep. So I'm really interested in working with community to create something new out of that technology. Mm. So yeah, very excited yeah, about it. That's fascinating. And mm. you, you can imagine just what the future holds for that kind of tech and, and others as well. Well, it's a totally new language. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Wonderful. Um, James, uh, one of the interesting things you've been doing at Brand X is actually from the ground up, uh, working with, a, with a, an access panel um, in order to make sure that every part of your business has thought about accessibility, every single part of your business. What has that process been like and, and what are the insights that you've then implemented? at Brand X with this panel? Yeah, um, so again, it starts with a relationship mm. and that relationship was uh, immediately entrenched in a professional contract, so it's a paid <laughs> position. And then um, Dan's job was to then convene peers mm. with lived experience and those peers are paid and that some are in the room. My bosses are in the room yep. <laughs> <laughs> and given authority, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I, I mentioned it before, w we had to do the homework. Okay. So it's not as if you give, um, uh, the, the access panel, the job to write a disability inclusion action plan, mm. cause that's our job, right? Yeah. But our job is to rip the band-aid off and go, okay, this is what we do. And, uh, where do you see the barriers? And the, um, and the response back is practical, okay? Because the scary thing is ripping the band-aid off and it's like, that's just bad. Put the band-aid back on, back in, in the cupboard, no more. <laughs> but in actual fact, that's not the engagement. The engagement is generous on both sides. It's practical on both sides. We were very adamant to be able to schedule uh, panel meetings so that we were able to actually do some of the work and then respond back. So it was very much about like a community cultural development practice, which was about kind of skill sharing, but doing the work, showing it, so that then it's evidence that this isn't a waste of time, this isn't tokenistic, that it's directional, and that's why you're getting paid on the panel, is that we'll take your ideas and then we'll transform them as best as we can into evidence. Um, knowing full well that this would also be the beginning of a confidence and a um, cultural safety process too, because we all we knew that if we had the uh, alliance of the panel, then they would be more likely to advocate us to their communities as well for opportunities too, which will be a very long process to achieve but we were lucky enough thanks to the wales family foundation to be able to receive some philanthropic support so we threw down the idea of going straight into a program that led to a short works being presented for world pride with that we were able to then use that as the litmus test for the you know the uh, the concepts that came up from uh uh, the access panel to be able to then apply them and test them in those environments with new people, new artists with disabilities that we'd never met before and then deliver the, the show through um, to presentation. Uh, so the information I can share with you, it, again, it is about um, soft, soft deadlines. Uh, it's also about like crypt time, so making sure that like the uh, the schedule isn't kind of against. Is that me? Is that me? <laughs> is that me? Hang on. <laughs> it is me, always. Um, so that the that the, the the schedule has a lots of space and room around it, which is kind of interesting because that's you know anti-capitalist kind of stuff too. So it's kind of cool. Um, Quiet spaces, um, lots and lots of money for support needs that come up from time to time. Knowing full well that people are in or out of hospital, in and out of um, medical care, or have like side effects from medication. You know, having lots of moments where really the desire to get the deadline done was kind of not really all that important mm. to us. Mm. Because of that, then the deadline is made. And the deadline comes across as authentic and true performance based upon what that artist needs to communicate to us. And so therefore, as an audience, we see the new 
voices, the new stories, the new characters on stage that we could never have done if we applied a producer's lens to it. So mm. beautiful um, experiences. Now those artists have been able to, of course, then use that work much like the Flying Nun experience to ship out and mm. shop out those experiences, th those um, completed works to other producers. Mm. And uh, so that has happened, of course. And uh, so the idea is this thing of uh, awakening to productivity, awakening to pipelines, knowing full well that the uh, community of artists with disabilities have also got their tremendous fear to get through to. So we're both meeting in the middle mm. and that this is going to be a really significant long journey, but you apply that in budgets for year and year and year in advance so that you're kind of committing to a long term experience and relationship handholding throughout the whole thing so that, you know, five years time, we're not even discussing these as revolutionary ideas. Yeah, it's just sure. business yeah. as mm. usual. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things you're alluding to is building trust in audiences, building trust in uh, with a community of artists with disability and audiences with disability. Uh, what would you say, Olivia, how do we go about building that, developing that relation of trust with disability communities in order to mm. build that audience? Mm. Interesting, I was just thinking about exactly that. Um, and I think last year, or the year before actually, mm. it was like 99% of our venues were accessible, but one wasn't. Yeah, right. And I do know that that, that, that venue, um, which is the Griffin, is about to undergo extensive renovations sure. to become yeah. accessible. So that is on its way. Um, but we have had years where the entire sort of venue usage of the festival has been 100% accessible. So um, when we went back to 99% accessible, community came forward and were, were very upset about yeah, that. Like yeah. you've made these steps to be 100% accessible. You've gone back to 99% accessible. Um, why is that? And yeah. so I think, you know, it reminds me about that trust issue. So mm. I'm pleased to say for the 24 festival, we are 100% accessible. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's like when you've established that trust and you have managed those kind of milestones to keep moving forward rather than backwards and and I think we um, then sort of said to Griffin look we're not going to use your venue the following year and they too have recognized that it's a challenge for them and so um, they've now been given a significant um, investment by state government to, um, to to make the sort of um, refurbishments and, and augmentations to that venue to move forward and in similar territory uh, we present a lot of free work right across Greater Sydney, accessible. Uh, last year, Frida Kahlo was um, a very successful project. We had tactile tours at Emma Bedford, who I believe is here, um, helped run those. We have a range of ways in which people can enjoy the Sydney Festival program. Um, and it's just to continue that and to increase it. So mm. you build that trust and um, the programming team are, ver are very careful and conscientious in making sure that whatever we offered last year, we do better even again the following year. But yeah, yeah. if it's vision impaired, if it's hearing impaired, if it's um, if it's an access uh, challenge, you know, in terms of a physical access to a particular location, like we, we tackle everything to make it seamless for for the audience. And I will also say that as a result of COVID, Sydney Festival at Home has been something that we're very committed to. So mm -hmm. um, we started that in 2022. And we bring the festival right to you in your lounge room with live streams. Yeah. Sometimes it's a, it's a pre-record and we leave that content up for, for three or four months. And yeah. now we're in such a rhythm that some of the productions we filmed the previous year, we released the following year. So you can see some of the highlights you might have missed in the 23 program, in the 24 program. Mm. And you can come into a lot of our major scale events online as well. So I think access, um, yes, it's physical, but also... Um, you know, artists with lived experience with a disability, it could be economic as well. There's all forms of, um, of access that we need to, to, to tackle and challenge. And um, the festival is very conscious of that. Yeah, absolutely. And then Janelle, at Australia's um, premier venue, how do you build that trust uh, when the range of, of disabilities is so wide? Yeah, I think that what I've learned from working in this space is that it, you have to do what you say you're going to do mm. and you have to be honest about the things and transparent about the things that you can't do at a given moment. I think I've built trust with audiences year on year by being um, transparent and delivering exactly what I said I'm going to deliver. Um, I know that sounds really simple, but I think sometimes it, when you're putting a show on and you, you've got a lot of other things going on, 
Sometimes you're not checking, making sure that every little detail is right for that accessible performance. Yeah. Um, I had a, a show and I've delivered so many shows. We've, we deliver 80 performances over a year. That's not including programming. And I didn't check the lighting plot for that Auslan interpreted performance. And that one small detail made such a difference on the night. You can understand that if your lighting plot is off and the Auslan interpreters are not in full light for that particular position, it's basically a fail on my part. Um, and I sat in that audience behind uh, the Auslan community and I saw them talking about what was happening. I could see them talking about where the positioning was on the stage. And it's just so important that we just continually make sure those details are nailed down and we're consistently improving and that we're open to feedback, mm. constant feedback. This is my, my job is not a job where I can go, that's done. Okay. I never need to do that again. I have to be constantly vulnerable to re re reevaluating everything I'm doing year yeah. on year, even mm. sometimes even month on month yeah. and making sure that it is the best that it can possibly be. And can I also say that for those of you who are starting on this journey, it doesn't have to be perfect, but be transparent about what you can and can't deliver. And if there is a mistake, be open about that mistake, reach out to the people in that audience and have that conversation, mm. which I do when things don't go the way that I hope they do, whether that be mm. a fault of mine or any other in the team. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've got a couple more questions for the panel, then I'm gonna throw it open to the audience now. You do have access, you can download the Slido app, S-L-I-D-O. <laughs> uh, and um, look, honestly, I don't know, how, how, what is this, um, what, what, what is this app? Um, <laughs> sorry? It'll throw yeah, no, Oh, there we go, yeah. there, there's, your, <laughs> there's your QR code. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you, if you scan that QR code, you'll get the accessible arts. Um, the Slido page, and then uh, questions come through, and you can vote on which question. You can either write, write in your own question, or you can vote on which questions you would like to hear the panel answer when we get to our Q&A in just a moment. And that goes for you watching online as well. Couple more questions for our panel from me, though. Um, what is the, the growth, and um, uh, what, what is the growth in this space? Where do you see us in five years' time, James? Where, where, where do you see us? Um, well, I think it will have an immediate impact on audience numbers. Yeah. I think it will have, those audiences won't be the subscriber fossil, <laughs> but there'll be a, a population that is hungry for representation and hungry to see themselves on stage and hungry for represent, representation and so the d dynamic between the audience mm. and the stage is going to be so electrifying because it's the first reveal may, and not the last reveal. Um, and then, of course, there'll be uh, new actors, uh, as in like your agents of change in organisations, but also on stage and also the, you know, the, um, uh, the new mentors for new voices and stuff. I was very fortunate that I cut my teeth uh, as a dancer and a director at Restless Dance mm. um, years back, back in Adelaide days. And uh, so that's transformative, that experience, that deep dive into culture. And so then that having uh, that exact same experience with audiences and also organisations transforming, it's, it's phenomenal. Mm. It's Absolutely. revolutionary. Mm. So Olivia, you've got two more festivals to program. Well, you've already done 24, 25's coming up. What would you, where would you like to see the Sydney Festival in 2025 as it relates to engaging with um, audiences mm. with disability? Mm. I think to in continually increase collaboration with mm. artists with a disability and see greater representation on our stages, mm. um, but also increase that um, visibility and collaboration and awareness through all aspects of what we do. Like okay. it'd be great for the role I have now at Sydney Festival to in the future, be an artist with a disability in this role as the mm. festival director yeah, of yeah. Sydney Festival. Yeah. That, that sort of, where can you see the future? It's mm. like to continue that diversity and that right. representation and to create the pathways to enable that. Um, just is sort of in listening, and I think you sort of um, articulated that so beautifully, like in five years now, we won't even be sort of talking about it because it'd be so ingrained sure. and, and so integrated. But sure. um, 
it, it, I, I feel that lived experience is so important. I, Janelle, you talked about those programs where programming and production got to sort of go on a journey and, and see what it's like. And I myself have had the experience of um, having adults with a disability or a, you know, or a child who might be sensitive to a, a particular situation into a relaxed performance. And having worked in programming for a lot of years where we do program a lot of relaxed ex performances, it was to actually experience a relaxed performance with somebody living with dementia or somebody who was hooked up to medical equipment that like machinery that made a particular noise yeah. or a child sensitive to the dark yeah. um, that you suddenly value, um, like like you absolutely value the relaxed performances and how and, and just what they can do for an audience experience. And I think the festival does very well in that space. We can always do better. But when you look at um, different presentation programs and companies and subscription programs, and not just in Australia, but around the world, is that fully integrated yet? No, and I don't think it is. I think there's just so much further to go. And, and it's forums like this, regular conversation with the industry that can help yeah. improve that. Yeah, absolutely. Janelle, how about you? Five years time, the Sydney Opera House, where are we? Huh. Using, in yeah, integration. Mm, I yeah. think that um, everything I'm working towards is about pursuing and prioritizing works that are integrating. Um, I've seen lots of fantastic shows that are integrating Auslan as part of the performance. Um, oh, audio description is my particular passion. Um, so for me, I would really, ideally, actually for me, I, I now want to go outside kind of where I am now. And I want to go out and reach out to everyone who hasn't been to a performance, who, um, who could benefit from it. And actually you, through collective action, through talking, through working with organizations, through working with mentors and people sitting in this space who support me, um, I would like to just reach out into community and invite more people in who've never been before. Yeah. And in five years time, that's who I want to see in the audience. I want uh, a kid who's never seen a relaxed performance. Mm -hmm. I want people who've never experienced audio description to have their first experience of that. So for me, I am all about, I want to be the influencer. Mm -hmm. I want to go out there and talk to everybody and um, get everyone on board to reach out to these new audiences and bring them into the space. Yeah. That's genuinely what I'd like to do. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. And it's a wonderful goal for us all to uh, aspire to. But my last question to our panel is how. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we keep talking about this 18% of the Australian population who identifies having a disability, what are the next concrete critical steps that we're taking to get to those ultimate goals, mm. Olivia? Stronger partnerships. Yes. I think, um, you know, we all roll partners into our sort of organisational structure, but deep, meaningful partnerships that um, are sort of like are contracted and, and, and solidified. I think we sort of have informal partnerships where we reach out, but I think if we were to have um, proper contracted partnerships, we may see with, with an agenda and KPIs, and, you know, like I so said, you knew there was, it was outcome focused. It wasn't just having the bit of paper. Yeah. Um, I think that's step one. And also you have to reflect on your artistic strategy and where does that align through the strategy? Because yeah. we're all working to achieve the KPIs that ladder up to our, um, you know, respective strategic plans. I think we're at a really opportune time with the new arts and cultural policy about to land. Uh, I was told by Minister Graham, our arts minister last night, that that's coming out in December. Um, so if you hadn't had a chance yet to shape what that could be, <laughs> get your letters in, your, get your correspondence in now. There's still a couple of months while that policy is being written. Yeah. I think we're right at the sort of precipice of being able to um, really make effective change. But yeah. it's not something where you sort of think about it and put it down. It'll happen tomorrow. It, you've, you've got to continually work at it and continually look back at your action plan and whether you've met that short, medium or long term goal. It takes work. It takes collaboration and conversation. Absolutely. James, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think the most important foundation is consultation, uh, time and listening, and as best as possible, turn into action, place it into strategic plans, allocate budgets to it, commit it into future strategic plans, mm. has to go to governance, mm. then it, it has to go to staff. We've got to pay people with lived experience and they've got to be leaders in your organisation in order for this to then kind of um, uh, broadcast to the community that we're serious, we're available and we're accessible in the sense of 
somebody with lived experiences on the other end of the phone or is uh, signing the checks, you know? Um, so yeah, it's kind of like very slow, but it is 100% uh, transformative. And the slow means it's easier. So it doesn't have to happen immediately. It just has to happen consistently. Uh, and for uh, us abled people, we've just got to drop the, f the fear of getting it wrong. Yeah, right. Janelle, what do you think? Collective action. I, I, could, I could not be where I am without just so much support from community, from my peers, from organisations. Um, continue talking to everybody you can talk to. This forum is perfect. Reach out over a coffee, grab a few phone numbers, find out who your peers are in the space, speak to them about what they're doing and who they're working with. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually bring together every two months a, a collection of peers from across Sydney institutions and we just share information and we share knowledge to try to keep, keep us all growing and how we can all grow our programs together. Um, so mine is just absolutely collective action and just be that influencer. Speak to everyone who comes to your shows, be at those shows chase them up afterwards if they're okay with that. Have conversations so that you can continue to deepen and grow those audience relationships and they'll bring a friend and they'll be a friend. And I know it's slow, but it does actually build. Thank you so much to our panel today. Will you please thank them? Janelle, Olivia and James. Now, we do have time for some questions um, and I was wondering maybe we can take any questions from the floor to begin with before we get to our iPad here, our Slido. Any, uh, anyone want to volunteer a question from inside the room? Uh, yes, up the back there, please. So, so the question is, are there any little uh, procedural or administrative, uh, uh, let's call them um, tricks or, uh, up your sleeve that, that you have in order to make things more accessible? Is that right? Yeah. And is that for audiences or for artists or for staff or... We've, um, so we've just gone through uh, disability confidence training with Accessible Arts, which I highly, of course, recommend. Uh, so we're experimenting with Access Rider at the moment, and for that to be an all organisation thing. So even if you identify as being an able body uh, staff member, you still are asked to um, consider your Access Rider conditions. And I just love the idea of Rider because that's so sexy and it's so strong and yeah. it's a very powerful yeah. thing. Um, and so that's kind of it. Uh, the beginning point, because what it is, is about saying uh, it's a disclosure, which is quite frightening. Uh, but then it's also, and it's, a, it, it's asking the question and then applying it, you know. It's almost like we need to all wear t-shirts, which is something like, you know, uh, how can I make, you know, my environment allow you to thrive right now? What do you need for that? We'll, we'll work on the wording, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not in marketing, good. but if yeah. anyone can help out. Uh, we, um, we have a brochure that goes out every year that sort of talks about the festival's program, you know, the 170-odd events. I mean, there's about 60,000 copies that go out on recycled paper, and uh, we do recycle them afterwards. Um, but we also provide that in a in a very like you know in a myriad mode of um, of ways. So we provide it as an MP3, um, so you can listen to the program, and we employ voiceover artists to sort of do exactly the same as as looking at a program, but but orally. Uh, we provide it in large print, so um, sort of big A3 versions of the brochure that we post out. We also provide it in braille. Um, there's a range of modes in which uh, we communicate the program to our audiences with a disability to make sure that um, sort of like no audience member is, is left out. And that's, you know, an administrative duty that the festival's been doing now for many years. Um, and I'm sure that would transfer to an EOI, to artists, what have you. Yep. 
Yeah, and I would note that all of these things take investment, mm. you know, and mm. uh, and takes the will to actually drive that investment, find the money, and ma and get it done. Did you have a question over here? <laughs> oh, okay. But it was just about, James, what you were saying about making up the application process um, more accessible because we're, we're from Sydney Film Festival, so we rely on online submissions for a lot of the local films that we get, um, especially in our screenability strand. Um, and so in what ways can you make that application process more accessible, more inclusive to, to get more people to, to submit? Um, from our experience, we offer video uh, uploads uh, for each of the questions. Yeah. We've also had to really release the um, idea of applications need to be 40 page documents as yeah, well, because yeah, that's yeah, impossible. Yeah. And it's also impossible for many uh, artists anyway. Uh, and then also having the time uh, for an applicant to be able to uh, speak directly to someone with lived experience just to check that it's doing what it says on the tin. And then also offering face-to-face. Uh, -face. So it's kind of like four options. Uh, as alternatives to the written standard Google Doc or whatever. What's your experience? Oh, I, don't, I, I don't deal with uh, that side of things. <laughs> but yeah, just offering alternate options. And I, I mean, you, you could also have a look at who you've had in the past make applications and speak to them and get that feedback. Because really, the only way you're going to know about your process is gathering that feedback and being open to having those discussions with artists that are out there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we got our top question here from the, the app. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> like heaps of thumbs up on this one. So, <laughs> how do you combat people in your organization who consider changes too difficult, not important enough to put effort, time, and budget into? What do you reckon? I start small. Yeah. So, I just start with, oh, we just need to do this. And then we need to add this. And then we, so I just start very small <laughs> and I explain the reason for my small change. And then I really have this really long term plan. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I just start very small. Yeah, playing the long game. Olivia, yeah. what do you reckon? Oh, I like that. <laughs> I might borrow it. Because <laughs> I do the opposite. I go big and then if I don't get the yes, it's, you know, it's really disappointing. And sometimes I won't back down. So I, I right. sort of like the start. I'm going to learn from Janelle, I think, and start small. <laughs> yeah. James, do you even have these people in your organisation who say it's too difficult? No. Uh, well, of course, I've got my governance. I've got my board who are my bosses. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think there is maybe a little bit of resistance there yeah. because that actually attacks something that's core to leadership and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it always falls into a, uh, a, a comment of, well, we don't know anybody stories and that mm. kind of stuff oh, so yes, yes. i think i think there's uh there is a tremendous um a lot of work to do on the mm. top tiers of leadership uh for a small uh to medium organization such as our own we're in a much more privileged position where we can be nimble mm. as opposed to having to answer to major government or you know major yeah. um stakeholders yeah it, that's interesting that question of we don't know anybody um, Annabelle Crabb recently wrote an article about it, that exact question, which um, you should check out. And the, the answer to it is just look harder, like look more, like keep looking, you know. And and the example um, in that case was about um, uh, the, the casting of Hamilton in Australia, and the producers saying, "Oh, how are we going to find so many actors of colour?" And, and the producers in the US said, "We'll just keep looking," and they did, and they found an amazing cast. Mm. So, can, can um, I can I also just add yeah. to that point? Another way of doing it is really get involved in your strategic writing, because as mm. soon as it's in that strategic plan, that you can hang hooks on that all day. Mm. Yeah. And um, if you're if you're t you know if you're able to give that fantastic pitch, and um, we we do have a very um, a great leadership team in terms of, of seeing that strategic vision. Um, you can just hang so much on that then. Mm. And, and yeah. so I would say really get involved in strategic writing and get into the, 
into the ears of people doing that strategic mm. writing. We right. also have an access committee and on that committee are um, stakeholders with lived experience with a disability and that committee meets several times a year and the access plan of the festival is tied up to sort of the um, agenda of why that committee is meeting. Uh, we also have a sustainability committee and obviously, you know, an audit, a risk, there's so many committees, but it does make sure that those systems and processes are being implemented. Um, and it doesn't just go in a plan and then never get pulled out yes. of the drawer. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions in the room at all? Other questions in the room? Okay, I'm gonna go to the next top one here on the app. How can mentorship and training be tailored to support artists with a disability in this sector? Mentorship and training, what mm. do you reckon? Mentorship and training, I mean, I, I think, again, there's informal systems in place, but some of these informal systems need to be formalized yes. to get the, the, um, the richest of outcomes. Yeah. And um, I think that's a matter of, uh, again, conversation and, and progression and bringing organizations together to step in and formalize that type of mentorship. It could be that you take um, like Canduco in the UK or um, Limitless or Ability Festival yeah. and um, or one of our um, companies like Back to Back or you know, there's many other independent artists like Dan Dorr, for example. And um, there's a host who could be a company or a festival that helps facilitate um, with, with their own cash as well as um, funding to find that mentorship and that program that can recur. It's, it's, um, it's kicking off that conversation and people coming together to formalize it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see informal mentorships, which is wonderful, but then they don't happen again because people just forget to informally have a conversation about it and do it. I think if we can formalize what's already happening out there yeah. amongst stakeholders. And again, I'll just keep coming back to rooms like this. this. This forum right now is exactly the platform in which these sort of sort of light bulb moments can happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you think? Mentorship and training, Janelle? Um, we recently, we, we actually are involved in quite a few mentorships with Accessible Arts and the most recent springs to mind. There was a framework for it, but we essentially sat down with the artist and said, what do you need from us? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think just rather than, I understand the formalization of mm. it, but the richness comes from that initial conversation mm. and saying, what do you need at this very moment for the project you're working on? And yeah, maybe it doesn't it. need to be formalized. Yes. Like maybe yeah. what we're doing is working because we, we like formalizing is a whole bunch of red tape, isn't it? So, yeah. I mean, I was thinking formalized because of the funding that might come with it. But oh, yeah. um, if it's actually more about just um, contact and conversation and mentorship, um, that's relatively easy to impart an offer, isn't it? So well, the, yeah, it's access. The yeah. person that we were mentoring, she sat down with me for an hour and said, and we spoke and then she said to me, well, this is the end of our hour. And I said, of course, this isn't the end of our hour. Like yeah. we are now connected. So you can come to me at any mm, point yeah, and have yeah, this conversation, yeah. Yeah. you know? Mm. I, think, I think that's really interesting because th we've always got to remember that these communities have been locked out and are denied access. And so in actual fact, if we're really truly going to build training and mentorship programs, we've got to start from the beginning, which is of course goes back to the con consultation and therefore user design mm. is critical to that because it's not like putting a famous person next to an emerging no. person and it's like, wow, fantastic, it's not. And every pathway is different. Like, um, user like a user design will be individual um, to, different, to, to, to different artists in different situations. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be a one size fits all user design. And yeah. it could actually be that the, uh, the trainee mentoree is actually looking to have permission for their voice. So, you know, it, it, it actually is, I, I think it just needs to be a, a complete redesign and the willingness to, to design from the, the beginning and individual and nuanced. Well, um, here's a connected question from Yasmin Arkenstall. Yasmin says, thanks so much for your amazing work. Just wondering if you have advice on how to market yourself and your work or shows as someone with a disability. Yeah. Mm. I would, I would prefer <laughs> to these two experts on that one. <laughs> How do you market yourself? I think, um, I think social media, and, and I'm using this in sort of a, like, I'm going to use an analogy which goes back to dance. And if you think before sort of digital media took off, um, there used to be kind of this, uh, 
oh, I don't know, there'd be a stigma around contemporary dance that it, it didn't attract an audience, that um, it, it wasn't very popular compared to theatre. And then the revolution of digital media happened. And because dance is about the moving image yeah. and you would see these incredible images on Instagram and different forms of social media and digital platforms, suddenly dance became sort of like, you know, that, that amazing art form that could speak through image. And I think I would sort of translate that to artists with a disability. Think of all the different platforms, you know, from podcasts to um, the moving image to different ways in which you can capture yourself and tell your story. We want to see authenticity. So um, that authenticity can come through in how you market yourself in a myriad of ways. But, um, you know, working with organisations like Accessible Arts to, to sort of to get that help and input, yeah. we at Sydney Festival would love to help artists with a disability and how they, you know, um, if they want any marketing advice mm -hmm. or what is it that they could do to better profile their work, um, you know, absolutely. But don't forget the power of image, the power of audio um, and the power of authenticity and telling your story. Mm. Mm. James, marketing advice? Um, that's complicated because there are many uh, professional artists with lived experience of disability who don't want to disclose. So uh, that is absolutely their uh, human right. Sure. <laughs> um, but I always go, if you're struggling with marketing, then in actual fact, work from your own neighbourhood out. Yeah. Because uh, there are people who really, really want to engage, but they really need a language that they can identify with. And maybe uh, this question's coming from someone who might have that voice that will release somebody else's ambitions and dreams because of the, um, uh, them being a mentor because they had the bravery to put it out into the real world. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions here in the room? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so the question is building a community musical theatre show and wanting to embed um, accessible practice at the beginning, where do you start? How, where do you go? Speak to the man right next to you. <laughs> so he's super obsessed with uh, uh, aesthetics of access. Building that in into the absolute core foundations of a project design. So it's not like having uh, a separate accessible thing, separate to the side, you know, stage left. Uh, lit well, etc. It's actually entrenched in the storytelling from the from the beginning. I think that's the future. Yeah. Just need to think about it, mm. and it actually gives power and agency to culture of disability mm. first. Mm. Yeah, um, I've got a question here from S, who says, uh, <laughs> as a theatre artist trying to get more audio description and Auslan happening in my shows. How do I deal with venues um, who put the onus on me to educate slash fund slash arrange, Janelle? Mm. That's really that initial discussion. Um, and it's just, uh, remember I said start small? Maybe just put one line in that initial email saying we will be audio describing and providing Auslan access and, and this will be at your cost. Mm. Or um, <laughs> start that conversation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it starts a conversation if you put that line in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, starting small and just having those conversations and talking to other organisations that um, have done it before so that you're talking to the right providers and just building it from that ground up perspective. Mm. Okay, here's an interesting question for each of you. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Chan asks, what are each of your plans? We've been talking a lot about... Um, artists uh, with a disability, but what are each of your plans to include creatives or artists with a disability embedded into decision-making positions within each of your organisations? Mm. Mm. What do you think about that? Mm. I think um, the future of, you know, forward curation of festivals is to invite guest curators in to do exactly that yes. and to support that pipeline. Um, to make that happen. So it, it starts with a conversation. It starts with um, a committee of artists that yeah. meet. Um, and then from that, you know, um, building that sort of that trust and reciprocity, if you yeah. like, to, um, to, to give agency and empower young artists to co-curate and to work with communities deeply mm -hmm. to bring them, you know, a huge diverse array of stories to the stage. Yeah, absolutely. 
embedding decision makers. What do you mm. think, James? Mm. Um, yeah, so it's consultation, it's paid positions, it's, uh, yeah, uh, like what we have and what we all have, the access to um, a panel of professional artists with disabilities. Uh, I was talking about before that, that deep desire to entrench it in governance. That's a much more larger conversation. I actually think accessible arts nationwide has a, a role to play in that, which is kind of like um, uh, governance confidence for people with disabilities so that they can become the future leaders, but the, but the environment won't, uh, currently the environment won't serve them well. So the revolution will take a little while, but why not bring in these leadership with the language, with the confidence and with the understanding of governance and structures uh, to knock on the door so there's no longer, I don't know anyone, stories because they're out there and they're very visible. At the moment at the Opera House, we're embarking on an employment program. We've embedded eight roles this year with Jigsaw. Um, as part of that program, we're looking at, we've, uh, we've got mentorships as part of that program because we understand that coming into the culture, we wanna make sure that someone feels safe and that they continue to enjoy that experience of working at the Opera House. And we're really focused on increasing that representation across the board. What's interesting is when we do an official survey of how many people working at the Opera House have disability, it's, it's not that greater figure. But when we do an unofficial survey or an anonymous survey, it's actually a lot higher. Uh, so it's also about creating safe practices from within so people will identify. So we make sure that that representation is, um, can be you know, discussed and we can bring it to the, the lived experiences to the fore so they, that it becomes part of that person's experience uh, in the job. Uh, so really just working really hard to increase representation. That's exactly what we've got to do. Mm. Okay, great. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Just a quick one for you here, Janelle. If you fail, um, asks Olivia online, if you fail at delivering something to an audience, e.g. incorrectly led Auslan yes. interpreters, do you refund tickets? Absolutely. Yeah? Yep. Okay, well, there you go. That's easy. That's, that's uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any other questions from the the room before I take the last one? Question, yeah. Yes, please. How do you get out of your name out there with your art with disability? How do you get your name out there with your art and disability? How do you get your name out there with your art and your disability? Get your name out there. Again, I feel like you probably have the beginning of your audience in the community that you currently engage in. Because remember, um, art is a relationship. Uh, and that relationship takes a while to nurture. And so I wouldn't be too impatient with wanting to hit, you know, the main stages. Keep it simple, build your audience nice and slowly uh, so that they have an appreciation for your voice and then you have the space to be able to listen to their response and to be um, serving um, your audience as well. Uh, and then of course you've got organisations that are here and exist to assist as well. And like we've mentioned before, you've got di the digital world which is actually completely open to you and accessible for you to create whatever universe you need to be able to promote your work. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, we, we hear your voice up on a stage very, very soon. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions from the floor, I'm going to take one more from the iPad and then we are done. The last most popular question is, how do you encourage large organizations to embed access at the beginning of a creative process of development rather than tacking on at the end? Mm. At the beginning rather than tacking on at the end, what do you think, Olivia? Ooh, there's best practice and then there's could do better practice, isn't there? Yes. And um, I think, I think 
look, I have to say the festival is um, is very vested in access. Uh, we, we plan every asset of uh, every facet, sorry, of the festival um, with access in mind. And we have a dedicated team, like a subcommittee of the organization that do that. Um, we, um, when we're creating work, like for example, we've got um, an oratorio happening at Coney Island in Luna Park, and um, and actually Rebecca, who's working on that, um, access is part of that conversation with those artists the whole way through from the very beginning. But we also present works where the the work might have been made, you know, um, a year ago or two years ago. So so we're sort of bringing the work in because we want that work to be seen by a Sydney audience, and we weren't part of that conversation initially. So sometimes there has to be some retrospective conversations with the company to say, we'd like to add these elements to your season and um, and are you comfortable with that? And to be honest, we've always had the most wonderful kind of response from companies saying, yes, 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 we'd love to do that. We never had the resources to make that possible with our show, but because we're now being presented by a festival, you've got the resources to help us do that. Uh, we feel so much better about that. Like, like you make us prouder of our work because you've now made our work accessible to, a, to the broadest audience possible. Many years ago, um, when I was um, curating the comedy festival at Sydney Town Hall, I did have one comedian who really sort of pushed back, but felt terrible about it, about the Auslan interpretation next to them, because they said, although they really wanted it, um, they, they were trying to remember of what was coming next, and they found it distracting. And so we found a way of, um, of having, like, like with lighting, we actually worked through that and found a way to have the Auslan interpretation at a particular area of the stage where the comedian could be over here and there was different kind of colour, different colour washes would come across the comedian, which would signify a two hour set on stage would signify the next part the cues, of yeah, their cues, right. their mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. And so we just worked through it. We mm -hmm. just sat down with their agent and the comedian and had a big conversation about it okay. and we made it work. Um, but I, I do think without that conversation prior to that, every time the question had come up, I think it was a fear of um, getting it wrong, it got shut down. But this time we pushed through mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and had the most brilliant outcome. And we even um, made sure that there's the seating in that theatre, we had an accessible section. So they had the most direct access, you know, to the Auslan interpreter. So we, we really did work it out um, uh, thoroughly and we, everyone felt very, very proud of, of getting there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just, again, conversation, isn't it? Sure, yeah. <laughs> A couple of cue cards, auto cue yeah. something. <laughs> 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 what do you think, uh, James? Access at the beginning embedded rather than tacked on at the end. Yeah. So I think that's the outcome of the revolution. And I think that's going to take a long time. And I think there's a, a joint responsibility here. There is organisations transforming small steps, the inner workings of uh, standard business as usual. But then it's also artists... Uh, from lived experience, having the courage to engage with organisations and to have um, the, uh, uh, to use those platforms, but also to um, create their own work as best as possible, so that the revolution is from the groundswell, and then there's also then the organisational changes in order that for that to happen. But w the biggest liability is the sense of cost. So if that's the biggest concern that you would face to be able to knit that kind of stuff into the DNA of, let's say, live performance, then in actual fact, that's probably thinking around about three to four to six year timelines mm -hmm. of having budgets being informed by the needs for aesthetic of uh, access to actually be knitted in from the beginning. It's a long process, but it feels like we're we've started it. Yeah. Janelle, final thoughts on uh, not tacking it on at the end? So if you've got a large organisation or a group of leaders who are not engaged, they're not there yet, what I would suggest you do is provide evidence. I know that sounds strange, but get some, get an accessible season, have an Auslan perf interpreted performance, have an audio described performance and bring back, have photography, have feedback from community at that session and bring it back to that group. So they, they may not attend that session. They may not have the concept they need to of what you're doing, but bring that evidence back to that group and tell that story of the accessibility and get them on board bit by bit. So in my life, having photos, having audio, having feedback from community that I've had at shows has been absolutely invaluable in getting next stage. So provide evidence is my mm -hmm. big thing and bring them on the journey, kicking and screaming if they will, but bring them on with mm -hmm. you, they'll be thankful. <laughs>
Brilliant. Janelle, Ryan, James Winter, Olivia Ansel, thank you so much for such a fascinating thank panel. Thank you so much. And I want to... Um, I also want to thank our Auslan interpreters as well, um, who've done such a wonderful job here today as well. Thank you so much. Uh, just to wrap things up, may I, uh, Amy, Joe Erskine, uh, Amy, do you want to hop up here? Joe Erskine, Head of Education from Bell Shakespeare, to say thanks on behalf of our host, Bell. Hi, Joe. Hello. Thank you. Yes, if we haven't met, my name's Jo. Um, I'm the Head of Education at Bell Shakespeare. Thank you so much to our panel and for everyone. What a wonderful vibe and feeling and warmth in the room. Uh, Olivia, James and Janelle, thank you for sharing so uh, generously and um, honestly. Uh, I think it's really important that we've heard um, not just so many success stories, but just open sharing about not quite getting it right or things that we're still working on. Uh, and so many tangible ideas, um, you know, big and small to start moving forward with. It's been a really, really refreshing conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, James, for being our wonderful MC. Um, and thank you, Accessible Arts, for, you know, asking us to be part of this wonderful hybrid series. This is the final in what's been a really wonderful series. Um, and thanking City of Sydney and Create New South Wales as well for uh, supporting the series and making it all possible. Uh, we've been involved with Accessible Arts for many years, but I guess in a more formal sense since 2019, uh, because, and it's very pertinent, that last question really leads to what I wanted to share about, which is a creative project that Bell Shakespeare and Accessible Arts have been working together with, which is led by director Dan Graham. Another shout out for Dan. No, 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 Dan. <laughs> Uh, Dan is overseas at the moment doing wonderful things, so I feel I'm, I'm speaking on his behalf, but I did want to share uh, with this room just a little bit about that project. Uh, the project's working title is Method in Madness, which some of you will note is a line from Hamlet. Uh, and as I said, it's led by director Dan Graham and Accessible Arts, and Bell Shakespeare is partnering and supporting this work. Um, the, the idea was brought forward by Dan to um, Bell Shakespeare and Accessible Arts, uh, originally about Shakespeare and neurodiversity, and looking at the concept of were any of Shakespeare's characters neurodivergent? <laughs> Do they have trait, neurodiverse traits? Uh, and really it's evolved from there. We did our first creative development, would you believe, in February 2020. Mm. Uh, very fortunate to spend um, a wonderful week in the rehearsal room uh, with a group of neurodivergent artists looking at uh, uh, you know, Shakespeare and, and however, it very quickly evolved to be really not about Shakespeare at all, although Shakespeare's involved a little bit, uh, but the project has really become uh, about sharing the experience of being a neurodivergent artist in the performing arts industry. And as part of the development of that, we've been doing creative developments with neurodivergent artists in the performing arts industry, but also to national call out surveys. And there may be people in this room who completed that anonymous survey. And I thank you so much for sharing your individual unique experiences of being a neurodivergent artist uh, in the performing arts industry. Uh, and again, that spirit of openness and sharing um, to inform this really important work, which is going to take us years, uh, but the next phase of it is another creative development here at Pier 23 uh, with a group of neurodivergent artists in, um, well, it was a couple of weeks, Amy. It's, it's mid-October. Uh, and as part of that, wherever we get up to um, over the course of those two weeks, there will actually be an industry showing of the work in progress. Um, I'm also a playwright, so I've been working on that project as a um, dramaturg and a writer and co-facilitator. Um, and so some of you may be involved in that project if you have completed that survey. Thank you so much. Uh, that and the date of the showing, I'm, I'm pulling a date out of my head. I want to say the October 20, October 25th or 27th. It's one of those. But we, Friday the 27th of October here in this room will be a showing of the work in progress. So we will be sure to share information about that should you wish to come along because it's definitely an opportunity for us to share wherever we get up to and, and, and whatever the work is and have feedback uh, from, from you and from our industry um, on that. So thank you so much. I'll hand back over to Amy. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you to our speakers and our wonderful MC for a fantastic and nuanced conversation. 
One of the many ways that you can better connect with audience with disabilities is to ensure that you and your teams are upskilled. So Accessible Arts is, as I said, the leading disability organisation in New South Wales. And I encourage you to head to our website and have a look at the range of art specific disability led training. All of our trainers have lived experience of disability, which makes a world of difference. We offer disability confidence training courses, as well as training in accessible comms, festivals, events, and exhibition design, and more. Um, I think what the uh, panel talked about today was embedding access, having creative access, or the access aesthetics, and that's also in our trainings as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, so. Special offer, <laughs> we're extending a 20% special offer to the first five people who book into a new training, um, creative inclusive workplaces. Working with people with disability requires understanding of varying access requirements and knowledge on how to implement reasonable adjustments. This online training session will take place on Tuesday, the 10th of October. So if you'd like to save 20% off and be one of the first people booking in, you can use the promo code BUILD all in capitals. Um, and you can go to it via the screen there. Look at that QR code. Um, okay, to wrap up, this is the last of our Access Ideas and Insights series, or hybrid as it kind of became known. Um, Accessible Arts is proudly, uh, was proudly supported on this journey by Create New South Wales. Um, and the City of Sydney. On behalf of Accessible Arts, I would like to thank our host venues, Sydney Opera House, the MCA, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and lastly, a big round of applause to Belle Shakespeare. Thank you. Uh, this series has been an insightful deep dive into reimagined futures, digital access, representation, and community connections. We could not have done that this without the wonderful team at Pyrus up the back. That's Adam. Um, the Pyrus team, Adam and Jeff, have worked really hard with us on this series to make it a hybrid um, event and to make the series as accessible as possible. So we really thank you, Pyrus. Um, and where am I up to? Okay. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank our awesome Auslan interpreters again. Big round of applause. Um, our brilliant panelists, our MC, and thank you to Daniel McDonald again for doing the Welcome to Country. Okay. Um, hopefully this series will continue next year um, at, for other amazing venues because we love to highlight the venues across Sydney and what? Oh, also there's a survey. Sorry. <laughs> There's a survey, another QR code. We love those. Um, please complete the survey about this event because all of that feeds into our funding. So please do that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so hopefully we will continue this series next year and we hope to see you all at other accessible art events. Thank you.